to the Lord in the house today. says that he plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. What is that flood? It's the blood of Jesus Christ. And how are we plunged to victory beneath that flood? got to get buried in it. I just feel the Holy Ghost trying to tell somebody this morning that if you have not gone down in the waters of baptism in Jesus' name to apply that blood to your life, that you need to do that. Because when you do that, he is plunging you to victory. And when you come up out of those waters, if you haven't received the gift of the Holy Ghost, God will fill you with the gift of the Holy Ghost. You speak, will speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gives you utterance, and your victory will come. That's how he plunges you to victory. It's in obedience to the Word of God. And so if there's somebody watching online right now, or if there's somebody in the sanctuary right now, and you have never been baptized in Jesus' name, and you've never received the gift of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking with other tongues, God says, if you will obey my word, I will fill you, and I will give you victory. Wonder why you can't get victory over depression, why you can't get victory over this, and why you can't get victory over that. God says, if you will be plunged, I will plunge you to victory in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. If you're watching online, you can look it up and you can, find the, you can find the address and you can find the phone number. You can find an email address. Why don't you contact us? We'll get you set up. We'll get you baptized if you need to be baptized. We'll, we'll get you in a Bible study if you have more questions. But God wants to plunge you to victory. Amen. He wants to plunge you to victory in his name because the victory is in Jesus' name. And the Bible says whatsoever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of Jesus. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Because there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. As a matter of fact, the name Jesus means Jehovah has become my salvation. There can only be in salvation, only be salvation in the one whose name means salvation, the one who became salvation for us. I can feel some resistance in the spirit right now. But I command every other voice right now to be silent in the name of Jesus. I take authority in the name of Jesus and by the blood of Jesus. And I command every voice that would speak contrary to the word of God to be silent right now. And I want you to hear the word of the Lord. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, as many as the Lord our God shall call. God is saying right now you need to be born of water and you need to be born of spirit. And if you will be born again, I will birth a victory in you that you, that you have been praying for and asking for and seeking out for, for months and maybe even years of your life. The healing that you have been seeking God says I'm going to plunge you to healing and I'm going to plunge you to victory and I'm going to plunge you to salvation and I'm going to plunge you to deliverance this morning in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus why don't you clap your hands to the Lord right now hallelujah 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 hmm. praise God praise God praise God praise God I'd like to welcome all of our guests that are here, whether you're here physically with us or whether you're in the 
online, watching online, welcome. We're so glad you chose to join us in whatever venue you are in and you're joining us. Thank you for being a part of what God is doing here. And, and if you've got more questions, you contact us. We can get you in a Bible study or, or we, can, we can sit down and talk a little bit. Um, but we are so excited you chose to join us. We hope that God blesses you through what transpires in this place today. Amen. Also, for those of you that are here, if you need a nursery, there's a nursery right back over here, uh, back on my left and your right, that big window back there. There's a nursery in there. If you do need to take advantage of that, um, there's a speaker in there. You can turn it on and, and, um, and you can hear the preaching still. Also, we will be having Sunday school in just a few moments, um, but the Sunday school is going to be up to age 12. If you're over 12, you're staying in the sanctuary. But because we do have Brother Rump with us this morning, we also want to give the option for some of you older ones, some of you tweeners, if you will. You're not quite a teenager, but you're not really a little kid anymore. If, if you'd like to stay in the sanctuary and hear what Brother Chris has to say, what the Spirit of the Lord has to say through Brother Chris, if, if you'd like to be a part of that, you are welcome to stay in the sanctuary. If you're between the ages of 10 and 12, you're welcome to stay. If you want to, parents, it's, it's your choice as well. Um, what you want to do, we will be having Sunday school up to age 12. But if you would like to stay in your between the ages of 10 and 12, you can stay in the sanctuary or you can go. We're just giving you an option. We don't give you a choice very often, but we're giving you a choice this morning. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Again, but again, the youth are staying in here. The offering plates are on the front row here, um, on kind of on the outside edges here. We're going to pray in just a moment. We're going to receive the offering, and we're going to continue to worship as we do it. And then God is going to bless us through the preaching of the word. Let's pray. Jesus, we love you. We love you, Jesus, because you committed your love toward us. And while we were yet sinners, you died on the cross for our sins. You gave yourself for us, Lord. You shed your blood. We're thankful. And Lord, we're thankful for all your many wonderful, great, abundant blessings upon us. And Lord, we are going to give in obedience to your word today. We're going to give our tithes. We're going to give our offerings. Uh, we're going to give generously. We're going to give bountifully Lord uh, because you said he that soweth bountifully shall reap bountifully and he that soweth sparingly shall reap sparingly Lord. Uh, so we're praying that prayer and that scripture over this offering right now. Bless those who give according to your word. Uh, give bountifully or give sparingly as they give Lord. I pray that you would give unto them according to what you you give as they have a cheerful heart and as they come as cheerful givers. Bless this offering to the upbuilding and the advancing of your kingdom and into the harvest that you have called us to and to the revival that you are going to give us. And bless us as we give according to your word. In Jesus name we pray. Would you come and give again the offering plates are right here on this front row. You can give um, and then our classes will be dismissed in Jesus name.
Jesus is trustworthy. Yes, he is. Amen. I'm just going to let that resonate for a moment. You can trust him. Amen. He's completely and totally trustworthy. Because he loves you. And he has good intentions for you. No matter what trial you may be asked to face, and no matter what trouble you may be asked to walk through, he is trustworthy. Amen? Amen. And when I think about trusting the Lord, I have not found many personal examples at least close personal examples in my life like the one that we have gonna, that's going to stand before us in just a few moments of trusting the Lord Brother Chris Rump has been here several times and he's preached and God has moved every single time that he has been here the last time that he was here was just a couple of weeks before his treasure passed on into her eternal reward. And I'm not here to put a damper on the spirit. But Brother Chris Rump is coming and he's going to step under this platform, under this pulpit in just a moment. And he is speaking from a place where he is in a complete and total trust relationship with Jesus. And as he speaks to you today, he is speaking from a place where he has learned to trust Jesus with all of his heart and to lean not into his own understanding. For wine or for oil to be produced, it takes crushing. And I have witnessed closely the crushing. In part, I've witnessed closely the crushing that this man has been under. But there is a fresh wine and a fresh oil that is flowing from this man. I am privileged to count him as a friend and as a brother, and I trust the God that he serves. I'm inspired by his faith and his faithfulness, and I'm believing that God has given him a word this morning that is going to help each and every one of us do the same. Amen? So why don't you lift your hands to the Lord, and why don't you just say, Lord, use your vessel to speak into my heart today. Through your word, speak to me in Jesus' name. Why don't you welcome Brother Rump to this pulpit with a great new Britain welcome. Brother Chris, we love you. God bless you. Praise the Lord, everyone. I want to tell you that God is good. He is. And when I say it, I don't mean it as some cliche just to say it. God is good. Yes. Amen. He is. He is good. He is good. He is good. He is good. Before I go any further, I want to thank. Pastor Tryon and Sister Tryon. And Sister Tryon, I also want to thank you personally for the letter that you hand wrote to me. You don't know how much it touched my heart in a time where I needed it. I have felt the prayers from all of you. Pastor Lewis and Pastor Marie, I want to thank you for your friendship. And you've been there through the whole time and the whole trial. And I thank you for your love and your friendship. We've got to understand that when God puts people in our lives, we are to value them. You see, we're in a day and an age where people do not value each other. You have got to value each other. There is great treasure that comes from the life of every person in this room. I want to let you know something. God sees you. I'm going to say this again. 
God sees you. You see, many times we get in situations, we go through trials, and we think God does not see us. God sees you exactly where you are. He knows your feelings. He knows your hurts. He knows your pains. He knows what you're going through. He knows exactly what you're feeling. We don't serve a God who can't be touched by our infirmities and issues. But he was tempted in all counts. He's felt the pain we felt. So he knows exactly where you are. I tell you, many times we go through situations. And throughout this whole last year, all of us have went through situations. It's not just exclusive to me. All of us have been through situations. But I'm going to talk to you today about what God has shown me through this. And I pray that if you can change your perspective as he has changed mine, you will see this thing through. You will see this thing through. Before we get into the scriptures, let's just lift our hands and begin to pray and ask God to open our hearts and our minds to receive his word. Father, I pray today over every soul that is watching and over every soul that is here. I pray over their minds. I pray over their lives. I pray over the storm and situations they may be facing or they may be about to face. I pray that you would give them clarity through your word. I pray that you would give them a determination to hold fast to you to trust in you, the God who will not change. You said you would never leave us. You said you would never forsake us. I pray today that that would be rooted in the heart of every believer, that they would trust you, God, trust you from the depths of their souls, and that they might claim that you are the God. You are the one true God that can save, that can deliver, and that can do all things. I pray today that your word would be fulfilled with power and demonstration that all might know that there is no other God except you. There is no one else more powerful than you. And there is nothing, I repeat, nothing we should put our trust in than you. Father, we come humbly and say, speak to your children today in the name of Jesus. The Bible declares to us, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I know where my treasure is, and I know where my heart is also. Where is yours today? If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Isaiah chapter 43, and we're going to start at verse 11. And I'm also going to be reading in Exodus chapter 14, so you can also thumbnail that one as well. But we're going to start in Isaiah 43, verse 11. And just when you get there, say amen, so I know you're there. The Bible reads, I, even I, am the Lord, and besides me there is No savior. I want you to listen to verse 12 carefully. I have declared. And I have saved. And I have showed. When there was no strange God among you. Therefore, ye say me. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord. Of what? That I am God. Jump down to verse 13. Yea, before the day was, I am he, and there is none that can deliver out of my hand. I will work, and who shall let it? Jump to verse 15. I am the Lord, your holy one, the creator of Israel, your king. Thus saith the Lord, which maketh a way in the sea, and a path in the mighty waters, which brought forth the chariot and the horse, the army and the power. They shall lie down together. They shall not rise. They are extinct. They are quenched as tow or as the wick in a candle. They're extinct. 
Today, I want to minister to you for a few moments the reason for your wilderness. The reason for your wilderness. God bless you. You may be seated. You see, we got to Isaiah 43, verse 17. There's a story that Isaiah is telling here. In this story, when you see this, it can actually be found in Exodus chapter 14. So what, how they got to this place was this. The children of Israel. There was a famine in the land. And everybody knows the story of Joseph's coat of many colors and the different things that happened with Joseph and how he ended up in slavery, went to Egypt, and ended up being the number two man in charge of everything. And he got his family and brought them into Egypt. But you see, when they came to Egypt, they were supposed to come for just a specific amount of time. But what happened was they got comfortable. Everybody say comfortable. You see, they hadn't been in famine before, but now they got into Egypt and they stayed there longer than they should. And they began to multiply and they began to grow. And Joseph was in command, so they had favor. And they were doing all the things, living their lives, enjoying life, doing things. But something happened in the process of time. The Pharaoh that knew Joseph died. And a new Pharaoh came on the scene. And he did not know Joseph or the children of Israel. All he knew is that they were multiplying too much and it began to get him fearful. So he said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to enslave them and they're going to be our servants. They're going to serve us and do what we need them to do and do what we want them to do. And you see, for 400 to 430 years, they were enslaved, beaten, forced to do labor. That comfort had now turned to slavery. Egypt is considered a type of the world. You see, all of us were born in sin, shaping in iniquity. We've went through our lives. We've gotten comfortable with the pleasures and the things of this world. We've gotten comfortable how everything is, not realizing that we are slaves to the world. And you see, there came a place in time after all the slavery, after all the beating, after all the things had changed, that now their tune changed and they begin to cry out. They were tired of all the pain. They were tired of being in the addictions. They were tired of being in the fornication. They were tired of being in this. They were tired of it, just like many of us who've been living in the world. Tired of all the issues, tired of all the circumstances, tired of all the unforgiveness. And we find our place sitting here crying out. You see, there came a place in my personal life when I was tired of all the drugs and ODing and all the things in life. And I remember crying out clearly, Lord, if you will free me from this. I will serve you. There's got to be a place in your life where there has got to be a cry that comes out. There's got to be a place where you say, God, I need you to free me. You see, they're sitting here enslaved in their own type of wilderness. And then there's one, Moses, someone who was rejected. Someone who lived in the palace, but he, he killed a man, so he went out into the wilderness. He went out to his own place of wilderness. And while he was out there doing his thing, living his life, he messed up. He made mistakes. God goes out to the wilderness with him and meets him in a place. And he says, Moses, I know you messed up. I know maybe in your personal lives, the Lord's saying to you today, maybe you messed up. Maybe you had aspirations to do things for God. Maybe you began to walk with him at one point, but then something happened and it derailed you. And now you find yourself in the wilderness, living a life not what you thought it would be. And you're sitting there day in and day out, going through the motions of things. But God comes to a point and says to you, come here. He does something to get your attention. And as he gets your attention, he says, come, but take off your shoes. 
even in the midst of his wilderness, even in the midst of circumstances that were beyond his mind control, God calls him and says, take off your shoes for the place that you stand is holy ground. You see, there's going to come a time in your relationship where you've got to leave everything else behind. His wife, Zipporah, was not there. His children were not there. Jethro was not there. It was him alone had an encounter with the almighty God. And you see, in his wilderness, God gave him direction. Many of us don't want to go into the wilderness. But God brings us to the wilderness. And you see, after God told Moses exactly what to do, we're going to push forward a little bit. He takes him in and he goes into Egypt and he tells Pharaoh two things. The first, he says, let my people go that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. And then the second thing he says, let my people go that they may serve me. And after the process of time, Pharaoh's heart kept getting harder. I'm not going to let him go. I'm not going to let him go. I'm not going to let him go. The adversary in the world, anytime you think that you might serve God, says, I'm not going to let you go. I'm not going to let you go. You're staying right here. I don't care what you think you are. I don't care if you think you're, you're going to try to go to church. You're going to try to change your life. You're going to try to have a relationship with God. You're not going anywhere. And you see, after the process went, it took the death angel coming and destroying all the firstborn in Egypt for Pharaoh to finally break. But that breaking was only temporary. And once it broke, all the children of Egypt or Israel left Egypt. And you see, now it brings us as we're sitting here in Exodus 14. You have the children of Israel. They were enslaved in bondage. And now they're sitting here, leaving Egypt, leaving all the things behind. You would think they would be excited and happy, right? As they're all leaving, everyone's leaving Egypt. God gives Moses specific instructions where to take them. And it starts off in verse 2. As I went through this chapter, God just began to download into my mind and he began to show things. And many times all of us, we think things happen and we think, oh, it's the devil. The devil did this. The devil did that. We're in this reason because of this and that. Do you know that there are times when God himself will put you in the wilderness? You see, so many of us want to have comfortable lives. But none of us want to go through trials and tribulations and hardships and anguish. We think, oh, no, no. If we serve God, we're not supposed to go through that stuff. Let me show you something. Exodus 14, verse 2. Well, actually, we'll start at verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they turn and encamp before pi Roth, between Migdal and the sea over against baal -Zephon. But before it shall ye encamp by the sea. God is the one who is leading them out. Listen to verse three. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are entangled in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. W well, hold on. God gave Moses the instruction to lead them out to the wilderness. You mean that situation and that tribulation in my life was ordained by God? You see, there is reasons that God calls us to the wilderness. And today I'm going to show you they are twofold. The first one is so God can reveal himself to you in detail. The second one is so you can experience the love of God that passes understanding. God doesn't just lead you in these hardships, lead you in the wilderness so you can die. But he does it for a reason. We blame too many things on the world and the adversary and this and that. When God is saying, I'm bringing you out because I want a relationship with you. I want you to serve me. I want you to go deeper. 
You've been serving me half-hearted. You've been serving me on the surface. And now I'm saying come. Now I'm saying come out to this place. And even in that moment, the Bible says that God hardened the heart of Pharaoh. After the children had already left Egypt, the Bible says God hardened the heart of Pharaoh to go after them. But you see, it wasn't just a simple hardening. In verse 5 through 9, it reads as this. And it was told the king of Egypt that the people fled. And the heart of Pharaoh and his servants was turned against the people. And they said, why have we done this, that we have let Israel go from serving us? And he made ready his chariots and took his people with him. Listen to this in verse 7. And he took 600 choice chariots and all the chariots of Egypt and captains over every one of them. The adversary said, I am not letting them go. I'm not just coming with chariots. I'm taking 600 of my select chariots, 600 of my select chariots and all the rest of the chariots. I'm putting captains over. God has called them out to the wilderness. And now the enemy is following them into the very wilderness God called them to. You ever wondered when you're trying to follow what God wants you to do, the enemy is right behind you? He does not want you to serve God. Do you not notice they said, why did we let them leave from serving us? The world does not want to let go of you. They want to destroy you. They want you to serve them. But God is saying, I'm calling you out if you will trust me. Will you trust God as he calls you out? As they continue to go out. Verse 9 says, but the Egyptians pursued after them all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen and all his armies overtook them and camping by the sea besides Pihai Harath before Beelzephon. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes and behold, the Egyptians marched after them and they were sore afraid. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. When is the last time you cried out unto the Lord? You see, they were leaving. They were trying to get to their freedom. But when they turned their eyes around off the destination, they began to see the smoke billing. They began to hear the, the stomps of the horses, the wheels of the chariot, Pharaoh's men screaming, we're coming, we're coming. And in that place in the wilderness where God had led them, they began to get fearful. They began to get afraid. They began to cry out. And they did something very dumb, which most of us do. You see, because Moses was not just a man. You see, Moses was given specific instructions by God. So as Moses fulfilled exactly what God said, you can consider Moses the walking word of the Lord. Moses was not leading where he wanted to go. Moses was leading where God wanted them to go. You see, you have been given pastors and teachers and leaders to lead you where God wants you to go. But if you began to do exactly what they did, it will mess you up. You see, in their statement, they said this in verse 12. Is not this the word which we did tell thee in Egypt? saying, let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians. For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. Too many times, God's saying, I want you to come deeper. 
But then when things get difficult, you began to blame the preacher. Why did you tell me to break up in that relationship? Why did you tell me to leave that job so I can be in church? Why did you tell me now all these issues are happening? Now I don't have a place to stay. Now this is happening. Now this is happening. Blaming the man or woman of God. I wish I would have stayed back in the world. I wouldn't have been in this situation. Wanting to go back and serve them. And our heart is drawn back to slavery instead of drawn to freedom. There has got to be a perspective shift. You see, there's got to be a shift in your mind that says, I'm no longer going to be a slave to the world. I'm no longer going to be a slave to sin, but I'm going to serve God with everything that I've got. And I don't care what it costs me. I don't care what I have to give up. I'm going to serve the Lord. I'm going to serve the Lord and not serve the world. You can't be double minded in your ways. A double minded man is unstable in all his ways. Trust is built when you go through hardship. You can't be comfortable and serve God. It doesn't work. How can he be our healer if we don't get sick? How can he be our deliverer if we weren't entangled in slavery? How can he be shalom, peace to us? If we're not going through the trials and tribulations, God wants to reveal himself to you. But you've got to allow him to bring you to the wilderness. You've got to allow him to take you through the storm. You've got to allow him. And you see in verse 13, here is where Isaiah 43, 12 connects. I read to you in the very beginning. The Lord said, I have declared, have saved and have showed. You see, in this verse right here, it reads, and Moses said unto the people, Moses is declaring, not his word, God's word. Fear ye not. Stand still and see the what? The what? The what? The salvation of of the Lord. I have declared, I have saved. Stand still and see how I will save you. Which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. God called your enemy out to the wilderness as well, not to make you fearful, not to make you scared. But he had an occasion against them, and he wanted to destroy them. But he needs you to follow what he said. He said, I have declared to you, stand still and see the salvation. Fear not. God wants to save you today, but you've got to give your life life to him. You've got to surrender all to him and allow him to save you. He can't save you if you run back into the arms of the world. He can't save you if you run back into the arms of drugs and alcohol and whatever vice the world wants to grip you with. But he can save you if you fear not and you stand still. You stand still and say, I offer my life to you. I won't try to fight this anymore. I won't try to fight against the preacher. I will try to fight against your word. I will try to fight against the wilderness. But I will acknowledge where I am. And I will say, create in me a clean heart. Renew in me a right spirit, oh God. Save me, for I cannot save myself. In verse 14 and 15, here is the place that God is reaching out. 
and saying to every one of us, no matter if you're already saved for salvation or you're not, but he's saying this to all of us. Verse 14 and 15 read as such, the Lord shall fight for you and you shall hold your peace. And the Lord said unto Moses, wherefore criest thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel. Speak unto them. And these four words is what you need to understand today, that they go forward. You see, many people get in storms and tribulations. And when the pain gets great, and when the grief gets great, and when the depression gets great, and when the stress gets great, you want to go backwards. And God is saying, go forward. You see, I had the choice to make. Too many people died in my life in the last year. Two uncles, an aunt, almost my baby boy, my brother, my wife. I could have stayed in depression. I could have went back and said, forget this walk. I could have said, why am I trusting you? I could have said such and such, but there's got to be a perspective shift. You see, too many people stay in their situations and they don't go forward. David said in Psalms 23, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. David didn't say, I stand in the valley of the shadow. He said, as I go through, I will go forward. But here's the thing you've got to understand. All day long, I've heard throughout the service from prayer to everything, salvation, salvation, baptism, repentance, the Holy Ghost. I want to show you something in scripture. And the Lord showed this to me. And I want to share it with you. In verse 19 through 20, the Bible reads as such. And listen to this very carefully. And the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed. That means he went out of the place of leading and went behind them. And the pillar of the cloud that went before them stood behind them. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. And it was a cloud in darkness to them, but it gave light by night to these. Listen to this, so that the one came not near the other all night. I want you to picture this in your mind. In front of them lies the Red Sea, water. Right in back of that water stands the man of God, Moses, the declared word of the Lord. Right behind that is the children of Israel. And now, as you have read, the very angel went from behind them and the pillar of fire that was there by night and the pillar of cloud that they followed moved from behind them. You see, that pillar was a manifestation of God's presence. So what you have is the water, you have the word of God, you have the children of Israel, you have the very presence of God that is separating them from Egypt, the world. This is a very picture of salvation. The cry went out, repentance has went out. In front of them stands the water, baptism. 
Behind them stands the separation from the world in them. In the moment when you are trying to make the choice to serve God and be baptized, God will draw you into a place and give you time and put protection between you and the world to make the choice to go forward. You've cried out. You've asked God, save me. He says, here is the water. Here is the salvation I'm providing for you. The only way you can be saved is to go into the water. Noah and his family got into a boat. And that boat was a protection for them. When the water fell, when the rain came and destroyed every wicked soul except who? Noah and his family. That ark was a typology of baptism. The water of the Red Sea that they are now told to go through is a typology of baptism. Only the water can save you, not being sprinkled by the water, going through and in the water. There is no other way. In that wilderness, there was no other way for them to escape. Two choices, go forward and be saved or go backward and be a slave. You see, I don't know where you're at today, online or in this room, but I'm telling you today, I'm declaring the word of the Lord to you today. God is saying, go forward. I want to save you. I want to deliver you. I want to heal you. I want to restore you. I want to build your life. I want to bring you out that you may feast with me, that you may serve with me, that you may live with me, that you can dine with me, that you can have victory with me, but you must go forward you must go forward you've got to choose life or death and the choice of life is still a choice of death because you're dying out to your will and you're following the word and the man of God lest you not forget that God gave detailed instructions to who Moses. Why? Because God has a hierarchy and an order of things. I give my word to the ones I give it to, and they give it to those around for instruction, for correction and righteousness, guiding your lives, helping you to get back on the trajectory, helping you to go forward, helping you to overcome, helping you to victorious. But it's your choice to follow the word of God, to follow the plan he has, or to go back to Egypt. The wilderness is brought to you to reveal who God is, to reveal his salvation, to reveal his love. You see, if he had not come and enrobed himself in flesh, that he might know our afflictions and that he might give himself a sacrifice for our sins. If he had not come down, we would still be in our sins. We would still be slaves of Egypt, but he came down in every sin, every issue, everything that we've ever done. He put him on himself as he stretched out his arms on that cross and bore the agony, bore the pain, bore the depression, bore the sins that he did not commit. He became sin who knew no sin. Can you imagine that? I have come to die for you. I've never sinned, but I love you so much. I'll take your sin. Half of us can't even deal with our own issues. Imagine one man, God in flesh, taking all the sin of the world. The anguish. The feelings of rejection, depression, suicide, all of it going through his mind, all the weight on him. People jeering him, come down from the cross if you think you're the son of God. But all the while, his love was so much deeper. Father, forgive them. 
that know not what they do. His love stretched wide for all of us. And he died and went into that grave. That grave is baptism. That grave shows that you're dying to your old nature. You're dying to your old ways. You're dying to that love affair you had with Egypt. And now you're saying, Lord, as I die, I'm going to go forward and live in you. Colossians 3, 2, ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ and in God. You see, when you give yourself to baptism and go in that water, you are saying, God, I die to who I was. I go down into the water, an old filthy creature. And because all that you did on the cross, when I come up, I am a new creature. Old things passed away. Behold, all things have become new again. You are a new life. And when that spirit comes down and fills you by the evidence of speaking in another tongue, it is just as that spirit that moved from behind them to leading them to the back of protection. There is supposed to be separation from you and the world. You don't just get God's spirit to lead and guide you, yes, into all truth, but it's also there as a separation from you and the world. You are now supposed to cleanse, mortify your deeds, change your life. Romans 12, 1 and true. I beseech ye, therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your and my reasonable service. And what? Be not conformed to Egypt. Not to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds that you, you, me, might prove that which is good and acceptable in the perfect will of God. You prove that by going forward. You prove that by following the written word of God given to the men and women of God to help our lives. You prove that by going into the water and being baptized for the remission, the taking away of your sins and the sins that went on Jesus. That was for you. You are saying, I believe what you did on Calvary and I agree with it. And he washes you. And cleanses you. He plunges you underneath the cleansing flood. And as they stood there, Brother Lewis and Brother Trine, if you could both come. I felt to do this as I was reading. The Lord impressed me to do this. You see, when they got to those waters... The Lord gave instructions to Moses. If you could both come up. And this morning when I was in prayer, the Lord said, I want you to do something. Pastor Tron, if you could stand there. Brother Lewis, you could stand right there. If you could both raise your hands in the air and stretch them out. We're stretching this out not just over this church. We're stretching it out over New Britain, over Connecticut, over our nation. This is what the Lord said. God said, Moses, stretch out your hands over the sea. When God will destroy the strongholds over this nation, over this city, over the people. Isaiah 23, 11 says, he stretched out his hands over the sea. He shook the kingdoms. The Lord has given a commandment against the merchant city to destroy the strongholds thereof. We are going to pray right now for every stronghold in your life, every stronghold in your family, every stronghold in this city, every stronghold in this nation to be broken. I ask you to stretch your hands if you believe that they will be broken. Mighty God, according to your word, we stretch out our hands over the kingdoms of this world, over the kingdoms of merchant cities, and we say destroy the stronghold. Destroy the strongholds. Break down the holds. Give us liberty in the spirit. Give us liberty in this city. Give us liberty. Strengthen. Bring back the backslider. Bring back the drunken. Bring back the souls from the north, from the south, from the east. And from the West, every soul that is for this church, bring them back. We bind the strong man. We go according to your word. 
and we stretch our hands out according to the word of God. That your power might break the stronghold. God is breaking it. God is breaking the strongholds in your life. God is the breaking the strongholds over your marriage, over your children, over your mind, over your thoughts, over your health, over your issues, over your body. God is breaking the strongholds even now. You've got to believe the word of the Lord that has been declared. If they had not believed Moses' word and went forward, they would not have been saved. Believe the word of the Lord. Trust in the word of the Lord. Trust that they are broken. Trust that they are broken. Oh, Lord. Thank you so much. Just for a moment, begin to pray. God is all in this place and doing a work. I want you to begin to pray. I want you to begin to ask God personally. God, break this stronghold. I've not went forward. I want to go forward. I want to move forward. Today, I will move forward. I determine to follow your word. I determine to trust in you. I determine to trust in the men and women you've given over my life so that, God, I can go forward. I can be saved from the world. I can be saved from the issues. I can be saved from my issues. I would be healed. I would be restored. I would be transformed. I would be changed in your image and likeness. I pray this day, bless my marriage, bless me and my wife, bless my children, help us all to come in covenant with you, to be in line with your word, and to raise them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Let me not look on the storm, but let my eyes look to you. Let my eyes look to you even in this wilderness, even in this storm, even in the midst of the wilderness. God's declared word goes forth. You have been troubled. You have been going through issues thinking that I am not with you, but I am with you, saith the Lord. I have never left you. Even though you may not see me, I am behind you, destroying your enemies. I have told you my word to go forth. It is up to you to do it. I cannot do everything for you. I can destroy the enemy. I can give you my word to lead and guide you. But there comes a place when you must grip onto my word and you must walk by faith and you must trust my hand to deliver you from the situation. I have told you, fear not, be still and see the salvation of your God. I have told you, you are my witnesses when there was no strange God among you to declare that I am God. Go for Go forward, saith the Lord. Go forward, saith the Lord. God is calling this church into a deeper dimension of spiritual power, into a deeper place of worship, into a deeper place of walking with him. He is saying, go forward. Do not fear, for I am with you. Your enemy will not overcome you. But I will destroy them, saith the Lord, if you obey my word. I'm going to finish some more. Thank you both. There's a little more we have to finish before we go deeper. Verse 28 through 30 says it like this. And the waters returned. You see, after they followed the instructions of God and stretched forth their hands. And they began to walk forward. Just as God had declared to them, they went through the waters on dry land. And after the last child and last person 
crossed over to the other side. The Lord said, Moses, turn around and do the same. Stretch forth your hand. And as he stretched forth his hand, the waters came down. And this is the place where Isaiah once again meets up. That it says the Lord took off their chariot wheels. The Lord confounded them. And the waters rushed in over their enemies. You will never get the complete victory God has for you except you go forward. You won't get it except you go forward. And as their walls came down. Verse 30 says, thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hands of the Egyptians. And Israel saw with their own eyes. At that point, no one had to tell them of God's power. Because God was not only showing Israel. But you see, all the mothers and children and those who weren't captains were left back in Egypt. They saw the destruction as well. So you see the very stronghold and the strong enemy that's come against your life. God will destroy it. And even those of the world will not be able to deny the power of God that was in your life by you moving forward. I'm going to give you a personal example. After my wife passed, she was a school teacher. The principal of the school, which was very close to my wife and the vice principal, they decided she's in a big school. It's in Connecticut to display the funeral for all the teachers to see. And during that funeral, God led me to speak the plan of salvation. It was not me. It was him coming through me. And in that moment, her principal, her vice principal, and teachers and parents all heard the word of the Lord declared. After that moment, when I went back home to visit, the principal came over to my house. This is a distinguished woman. She sat down on our floor while my son's sitting in the playpen and says, I don't understand. When I went to that funeral, because she drove to Delaware for the funeral, I have felt something I've never felt. I don't understand how you in your grief can do and say what you're saying. And I told her, it is because of the gift of the Holy Ghost that God wants to give to everyone who desires it. But you've got to repent. You've got to be baptized. And I know that God has opened the door because so many of those teachers have reached out to me and connected with me. And God is going to do a work through the storm. But the seeds would not have been planted and sown if I don't go forward. And if you don't go forward in the storm of your life and continue to hold and trust in God, continue to worship him, continue to believe him, continue to love him with everything and turn your back to the world. You will never see the fulfillment of God's plan in your life. And those same enemies, if you don't go forward, they will destroy you. Verse 31 says, as I come to a close, and Israel saw that great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians, and the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. You see, when you get to a place of trust with God, you will have a fear, a reverential fear for God. You will believe his word. You will believe him when he declares to you, I will never leave you or forsake you. You believe him when he tells you when the plan doesn't look like it's going right. My ways are perfect. And you will believe the servant. Moses. You will believe the men and women God has placed in your life 
to give you godly counsel so that your enemies can be defeated and that you and your family can move forward. I started off reading Isaiah chapter 43. Verse 18 says it like this. Remember ye not the former things, neither, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall ye not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The beast of the field shall honor me, the dragons and the owls, because I give water in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my people, my chosen. This people have I formed for myself. They shall show forth my praise. The reason for your wilderness is so you can see God revealed in your life in a deeper manner and your trust can grow and that you can see how great our Savior's love for you, that he died for you, that he was buried for you, and that he rose again with all power in his hands. And every one of us that believe and trust in him will also rise with that resurrection power. But we must go forward. Brother Lewis said it before, if you have not been baptized in Jesus' name, you can do it today. Get in contact with them. If you need a Bible study to understand even further, get in contact with them as we all stand. You've got to determine in your heart today, I'm going to go forward. You see, I can't see where every one of you lie. Only you can. You know the wilderness that God has called you to. I want to make sure that you stop blaming the adversary and stop blaming the world and all the issues for the things going on. And I want you to begin to say, God, what are you trying to teach me in this wilderness? However you are comfortable, if you desire to come forward, come forward. If you desire to stay there in worship, I want you mentally and in your voice to go forward. But I want everyone in this room, wherever God has placed you, wherever you have stopped in your walk, I want you to begin to move forward. God is going to continue to heal and continue to restore and continue to deliver. But guess what? You have to go forward. Father, I pray right now over every soul. I pray against spirits of fear. I pray against spirits of doubt. I pray against spirits of unbelief. And I pray that the truth of your word would resonate in the hearts of every person watching and every person in this room. And there would be a determination that says, God, I've been in this wilderness. I've been in this season. I've been in this issue for so long. And I'm no longer going to just sit here. But now I'm going to go forward. I'm not going to fear, but I'm going to go forward and see the salvation of God. I'm going to believe you and trust you all the way through. I'm not just going to give up and turn around to Egypt. But God, I'm going to move forward so that you can show me your glory, so that you can show me the depths of your love. I pray over every soul in this place, God. Let them be as the children of Israel and cry out unto you. Let them from the depths of their bowels be tired of being the servant of the world, but begin to serve you. I don't just want you to listen to me pray. There's got to be a moving forward. There's got to be a cry that comes from your heart.
turn it back over. I just wanted to say one more thing to you. God is taking this church to a deeper place. But God is requiring more of us in this new season than he did in the old days. God is saying, I desire to do a great work. I desire to reach the hearts and souls in this city. My heart groans when I see lives that are lost. And I am asking you, my people, yield yourself to me that I can flow through you. That the souls can be saved. For it is not my will that any should perish, but that all should come to me. God is desiring for our hearts to yearn for him and yearn to see souls saved. Amend your ways. Destroy those things in your life that are not right. God gave me a dream two nights ago, and I didn't know what it meant. But now I understand. He gave me a dream of three serpents. And at first I was laying on the ground and I got up and ran and I looked behind me and I saw one that was orange and white. And then I saw that one that was black and white. And then I saw a black cobra. And as I went in the Google just to research about these different things, I found that the the black and white one and the orange and white one were not venomous. But the cobra spits his venom. And in the dream, I had a hoe in my hand and I began to smash the one of the spit, the venom, the venomous one. I began to destroy it and others came with me to destroy the other ones. God is saying, you've got to get rid of the serpents in your life. It doesn't matter if they are dangerous. Get rid of them. They were small. The orange and white one and the black and white one. I don't know what's in the life of you, but God is saying, get rid of it. Destroy it. Give yourself to me. Don't try to do it on your own. I will destroy your enemies, but you have got to trust me and not try to do this thing on your own. We have got to come together as the body of Christ. We have got to be vulnerable with one another. And we have got to trust God for the miraculous. For he is standing at the door waiting patiently for us to get to the place where he can do what he wants to do. But we have got to yield, submit, and obey everything. You can't be half full. You can't be three quarters full. Your cup has to overflow. You need to be filled with all the fullness of God. And I pray today that even as you leave this place, you would examine your heart and begin to shut out the distractions and find that quiet place. Find that place in the wilderness, even as Moses did, that holy ground where you and God can connect one on one and where he can give you instruction on what you need to do in your life. Oh, Jesus, Lord, I thank you. I thank you for your word. I thank you for the hearts that have been receptive to your word. Father, we know that your word will not return unto you void, but God, you are bringing forth an army 
You are raising up an army through these leaders, Lord, that they would go and do your bidding, that they would submit and be ambassadors of you, that they would be your disciples and witnesses that you are God, and that all this state, all this city would see that God is alive and well, that the miraculous is flowing, that the blind's eyes are opening, that bodies are being healed, marriages are being destroyed, lives and addictions and strongholds are being broken because there is a people that are called by your name who have given you everything who have consecrated their lives and said God use us no matter what situations in front of us use us we are available to you we are available to you we are available to you feel that there's more in the spirit. I feel there's more that God wants to do right now. of the Lord, my people, my soul and my heart have reached to you. You have wondered about the signs and the wonders and the miracles. You have wondered about the demonstration of my power. You have wondered where is the glory? Where is the power? It has always been here. It has always been free and available to you. The only thing that has hindered my power is you have not yielded to me fully. And I have cried unto you and spoken to you in the quiet times when you have been in prayer, when you have fasted and sought my face. And I have wanted to do great wonders among the land. And I have been searching for vessels to use. And my heart has been overwhelmed 
because I have been searching and not finding souls that would be yielded to me. So I am crying out once again to you. 